Good morning, you all. Your Excellency, Froilat Zalan, Governor General of Belize, Ambassador Nestor Mendes, Assistant Secretary General of the OAS, distinguished faculty, staff of invited universities, students from our schools, colleges, and universities, OAS colleagues, ladies and gentlemen across the Americas. It is my pleasant duty to warmly welcome you and to thank you for joining us as we present a special edition of the series, A Chat with the OAS. The American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples adopted by the OAS in 2016 affirms that indigenous children have the right to all forms of education without discrimination. Countries shall promote intercultural education that reflects the worldview, histories, languages, knowledge, values, cultures, practices, and ways of life of indigenous peoples. To shed even greater light on these issues, we are graced by the presence of a uniquely positioned invitee, Her Excellency Froila Salam, the Governor General of Belize, Amaya Mopan, who is the first indigenous woman to hold the title of head of state in the Western Hemisphere. Governor General Salan is an anthropologist with an impressive life story. The formal start of today's conversation will be the transmission of a video message from the OAS Secretary General Luis Almada, an uncompromising supporter of the idea of more rights for more people. Indeed, he is the Secretary General during whose tenure the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was adopted. I invite you now to share in the video presentation. Please, Mauricio. I'm honored to welcome Her Excellency Froilat Salam who is making history as Belize's first Governor General of Indigenous Birth and Heritage. At the OES, we acknowledge Her Excellency's remarkable and inspiring background as an anthropologist and community leader of the Maya people of Belize. Her life and professional trajectory represents a great victory for the Indigenous cause, not only in the Americas, but in the world. It is of great significance for our organization to host this dialogue with Assistant Secretary General of the Organization of American States, Nestor Mendes, about indigenous identity and cultural education. Just last week, we celebrated the fourth Inter-American Week for Indigenous People. During the week, we heard indigenous leaders and representatives advocating for an equal intersectional and inclusive participation in the draft of a new social contract in a post-pandemic world. Now, please allow me to share two short comments about the topics you will consider at this event. The first one is that we are currently witnessing a shift from a politics of the traditional political parties to a politics of identities. We see civil society gaining political representation across the world through its multiple groups united by a shared identity. Her Excellency, with her appointment as the first indigenous governor general in the Commonwealth, represents a paramount example of such a historical struggle. My second comment refers to the other theme you will discuss, cultural education. At the OES, we envision indigenous education as a holistic, lifelong process that empowers all indigenous people to accomplish their aspiration and contribute to their communities, nations, and societies. Education is a practice of freedom. Everyone has a right to discover knowledge, the skills and tools they need to pursue a just and sustainable future. Indigenous education is built on the values and practices informed by indigenous cultures, languages, and histories. It is a dynamic lifelong process that involves formal and informal learning. The primary role of indigenous education is to transmit indigenous ways of being while providing support and resources to all allow students to reach their full potential as healthy and creative members of their communities. Our organization is proud to host this event to learn from the experience of Her Excellency as a scholar, cultural educator, and outstanding activist of indigenous rights. Welcome. Thank you very much. 
uh, uh, just a note, uh, this event is also being transmitted through Facebook, the OAS National Office in Belize Facebook. Um, now, it is likewise my distinct honor to acknowledge the participation in this conversation with Her Excellency of Ambassador Nesto Mendes, the Assistant Secretary General of the OAS, and not the Belizean, who believes that determination, persistency, and good education can transform lives. Assistant Secretary General Mendes, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Mr. Uh, good to see you again uh, in your new position. Uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Luis Coimbra, OS representative in Belize, Ambassador Henry Martin, a coordinator of the network of OS national offices across the Americas, OS representatives and colleagues across the Americas, faculty and students of institutions of learning. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to welcome you to today's chat with the OAS. Last Friday, as mentioned by the Secretary General, the OS concluded the commemoration of the fourth Inter-American Week for Indigenous Peoples under the most fitting theme of leaving no one behind, indigenous peoples and the call for a new social contract in the Americas. The week was marked by several high level discourses, including a special permanent council in which we were deeply honored to receive and to hear from Her Excellency, Governor General of Belize, a most worthy advocate whose birth, life and experiences bear living testimony to the tremendous contributions of indigenous peoples and their positive impact on the nations of this hemisphere. Madam Governor General, we are again honored to welcome you to this chat. A unique platform through which we are able to shine a light on the lives and work of remarkable individuals such as yourself in the hope that our people of the CARICOM subregion and indeed those across the Americas can be informed, inspired, and invested with your can-do spirit. The format of today's chat with the OS has been slightly modified from previous ones. In we will be favored with Her Excellency a conversation that affords us an opportunity to delve into the Governor General's trajectory award in the illustrious position she now holds as head of state and the legacy and impact inherent in this richly deserved appointment. Your Excellency, every citizen of Belize, I am sure, is proud of your accomplishments. And I dare say the peoples of the Americas are equally impressed by your appointment. And so if you allow me, I would like to, to start our conversation by asking a couple of questions and to, to get a, a more panoramic view of your history, your inspiring story. And then at the end, uh, I would invite you to get into the substantive uh, topic of our chat with the OS today. So uh, with your permission, um, I would like to ask you to share with us, you know, to speak to us succinctly about your life story, your trajectory from a child with dreams shared by many youths across the hemisphere, all the way to your appointment as head of state of police. I am sure a lot of us, a lot of our viewers want to hear your story. Madam Governor General. Good morning, Jose Shahaskada, Boitiktika, which count the he. Good morning, thank you for this um, wonderful day and for the invitation to join you this morning. Thank you for your kind words, Ambassador Mendez. Um, I've been meaning to ask you and you asked me earlier, um, if we remember the day that um, we shared a classroom at sixth form and I said like yesterday, my journey has been one that has started in San Antonio and um, I didn't know where it was gonna take me. And what I can say is I came from very 
humble background, but imbued with cultural richness that my parents made sure we got a thorough understanding of. At the same time though, while my mother and father had to speak our native language at home, you we were also taught English because my parents recognized that times were changing and that in order for us to move ahead in terms of being the best that we can be, we would need to be able to straddle the two worlds. So from a very early beginning, my father was a nascent um, community leader and he recognized and imbued in us the value of cultural education. And never for a moment did we feel we were denied anything in life. We had ample food, which we gathered from the forest nearby. My mother, uh, very unusual for her, was a feminist in the sense that she believed that despite being a traditional woman, she could also provide for her family. And she was actually a, uh, a subsistence farmer. And as Sherry we would go and help her clear the field, plant and harvest. So those things I grew up with as, as being normal. And part of those rituals of farming was also giving recognition and acknowledging that we live within the natural environment. So we would offer prayers and and, and, and popal to the, what they call the Santo Hoke and Santo Vitz. Those are the spirits of the, of the physical world. And that was to recognize that we live in a balance, that we can't take more than what we can use. We can't hunt more than what we can eat. And so from the very beginning, I was taught that you need to understand your physical environment in order to be able to live a balanced lifestyle with it. High school, was very interesting because there was a point when my mother said, you're not going to go to high school. And we have to acknowledge that it was a time when parents really only supported or invested in their male children because there was the understanding that, you know, parents were fearful that their daughters would go into the, into the Western world and become pregnant or become unduly negatively influenced. So I had to beg my mother and my father as my greatest advocate. He said, Juana, you cannot deny your daughter that right to education that we have given the other daughters. So my father was my biggest advocate and that's how I went to high school. That's how I went to sixth form. Again, I had no idea that sixth form existed um, up until I think the month before graduation. That's how isolated to a certain extent the high school was that I, that I went to. And from there, I worked two years and I did archeology. span discovered that it was far more sexy watching it on PBS than it was actually being in the field. And so I thought, well, you know, I really, at this time there's a lot of uh, Maya movement, revitalization going on. And I thought this is something that I really like because culture interests me. How is it that people behave the way they do? What is it that makes them think? Why is it that um, in my society where the elderly, the disabled, everybody had an equitable access to the natural resources within our community, but when you left that community, you were confronted by a different value system where it was about the individual success, uh, individual people's um, egos to a certain extent that was the motivating factor and, and what was prided as success. And, and those questions I couldn't answer. I would ask people, but nobody really seemed to understand apart from, well, that's the way of the world. But my father said, we can't live in a world where you only think about yourself. You have to think about your family the community you live within, and also the, the villages that surround your community. And of course, Belize, um, Belize only became independent when I was 11 years old. So I had a memory of British Honduras. And again, that affected my way, uh, I think, of the Commonwealth, for instance, this history, this colonial legacy that we have that I believe we're still trying to work our way through. I had no idea what my life was going to be like. I was just going through the motions. And, but the one thing that kept me grounded was the knowledge that I was a Mopan person, not even a Maya person, a Mopan person. That was the cultural identity that I grew up with. I speak the language, I eat the food, and as much as possible, that was who I was. It never occurred to me that, in fact, even last year, I mean, this whole thing of being the head of state is something completely new to me and one that I embrace fully because it is such an honor for people around me to recognize the contribution that I have given to this country so far and, and to see what else I can do for it. Um, I, I, I wouldn't 
I didn't know, and I keep teasing people, I don't know what, what I want to be when I grow up because I feel there is so many options that are available to us. And I think Belize being a new country, a new democratic country, really and truly to a certain extent was, was um, trying to develop its citizens, which it sees as just one type of citizen. And I think what our contribution has been as indigenous people, as indigenous Maya is that there are many ways to be a Belizean citizen is not just one way. And I can say that being the head of state is an example of how that can manifest itself. Thank you very much for sharing that inspiring story, Madam Governor General. I remember when we were starting to plan this event and uh, one, uh, a young lady in my office, uh, when we were brainstorming, she said, you know what, it's important what I would like to get, what I'm sure many, many of our viewers and participants would like to get, is to listen to her story. So thank you very much for sharing that uh, with us. Um, clearly, um, what you have described is, you know, that grounding, that connection with your cultural identity from small, but also, you have emphasized the importance of education, which has played a major role in your ascendancy. And not so only as your mastery of academics, which is highly important, but it's also education and awareness about your heritage. Um, perhaps you could share with us a, a little more about that in, in, in its broadest forms, you know, and uh, the preparation, what is needed uh, for indigenous populations to realize their fullest potential as we have seen you, a prime example, to do. If you could share some of that with us, I think our viewers would be really, really appreciative. So yes, cultural education, how was that manifested growing up? I think culture is the worldview, is one way that we interact with reality. So for example, the physical environment was not just something to extract from, to take from. It was something that sustained us. And I think that's a very important value, particularly now as we're looking at climate change. Um, we have seen where the extractive industry and taking needlessly without what we now call ecological accounting, where that has left us very vulnerable to the point where climate change is really the, the new existence, existential threat for all of us. But growing up, so it was like I said, my mother, my father, my mother had her altars and even though we grew up Roman Catholic, um, there was also a space within our spirituality that allowed us to manifest itself through rituals such as giving um, incense and prayers to what we call the, 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 the spirits of nature. Um, and language was really important. And I didn't really realize this until I actually started writing the Mopan Grammar book. Um, in Guatemala, there has been, well, the, over the centuries, there have been attempts at documenting the Maya language, which you know, Guatemala, Belize, Mexico have Maya people, and we have over 20 Maya languages, but we didn't have a unifying orthography for it. So when I started writing the Mopan, um, my, my contribution to that was looking, well, I was amazed to find out for instance, just how many loan words we had from Kechimaya, which really showed the intermarriage and the, the, the close relationship that we've had with that particular Maya group. But language is a fundamental way of screening the world. When I was growing up, I remember this uh, story about the people we now call the Inuit, how um, they had multiple words to describe snow. And it's the same thing with it with Maya people. We have so many ways of describing the type of season we're exper experiencing during the um, the dry season, for instance. So we can say if this good, if this wind is good for burning our, our farm, for instance, or what, what are the insects telling us in terms of when is it going to rain? Is it going to be a good harvest? So we were, we were very in tuned. And these were things that were related to us as stories from my mother. Oh, she said, look, that insect is flying around. This is what it means. Um, that tree is flowering this time. This is what it means. So that is the traditional knowledge that we had growing up in a rural environment that we don't learn about in science, in biology. Uh, I think it's just very recent we've been talking about how traditional knowledge 
can signal through the ecosystem what is taking place physically. So that's a cultural education that we're talking about, but also the fact that you need to put back into the land. You just can't continue taking and taking because eventually the land will become poor and you'll not be able to provide for yourself. So the cultural education wasn't like in a formal setting where you come, you have a teacher, okay, today we're going to learn about this uh, and have a lesson plan. It was just living it by day, you see an event, the parents describe it according to how they understand it. So oral history was a major part of that, that um, traditional transmission. And that is what is missing from many of the bilingual intercultural educational system um, that children are divorced from their physical environment, from their cultural environment, and being taught in a way that doesn't really make a direct application to what they're experiencing. You know, I get the sense that we could listen to you and, and, and all of this knowledge for, for all the, uh, but I would like to, to just perhaps ask two very quick questions and, and then ask you to get into the, the core of the, the presentation you have to share with us today. So um, clearly I gave you the example of this young lady in my office who wanted to know about your story. Um, I'm sure that that will inspire a lot of people across the Americas. Uh, but if you had a particular message to give, especially to young ladies, um, to, you know, at the OLS, uh, a very important part of the work we promote are not only general human rights, but we also look to empowerment of women, uh, recognizing the contributions also of other uh, groups in society, the indigenous people, the Afro-descendants, and now there's a lot of work with those. Uh, but if you had a, a message to share, especially with, with your women who are looking up to you, what, what would be that message? And, and finally, you know, if um, when you, when, when future tells, when, when history tells your story, how is it that you want to be, to be remembered by Belize? That's a, such a loaded question there, Ambassador. Um, for me, history is so important and one of the first jobs I had was trying to explain the colonial gap that as a Maya person I saw existed. We knew about the ancient Maya. We know something about the modern Maya, but we didn't know what happened to the colonial Maya apart from what was written um, during the time of Diego de Landa in Yucatan and some of the you know, results of the caste war, for instance, in populating Belize the issues that we had in Guatemala where people left, and people have been migrating. And one of the things I learned from history is that we are a people of migration. We have never stayed in one spot from the time of the origin of Homo sapiens, we have been moving around globally. And so uh, it's interesting now with the climate change, we now have a huge, huge um, issue with migrants. And people are calling about talking about climate justice. Uh, people are leaving because they have no choice. So history can teach us a lot. And I have no formal background in history, but I can see like looking at patterns, looking at what has been taking place in different countries, trying to understand the, the structural issues. You know, what institutions are in those countries that has led to certain decisions being made? So I, I attempted to understand how Belize came to be. Because I think unless we ask some uncomfortable questions, we will never be able to move ahead as a young nation in particular. And part of that has to deal with indigenous people. We had to do a lot of advocacy locally, nationally, and internationally as to why, for instance, we were trying to get our land rights acknowledge legally. In Belize, there was discussion initially about, oh, the Maya people want special rights. And we had to, to basically say that rights are not special. This is what you have as a citizen of this country. And you have the constitution. We have um, so many other international norms that, and conventions that allow us to demand as a part of the social contract between citizens and their states. The citizens are rights bearers, 
the, the state is a duty holder. Is it the other way around? Rights holder and a duty bearer. That's the other one. That's what I meant to say. And that's what the social contract is about. So, but if you don't know anything about social contract, if you don't know the history of how that social contract has evolved to how it is being manifested today, we will never be able to move ahead. And a core part of that discussion to my mind is identity. If you're not confident in who you are, regardless if you're a, a man, a woman, or male, female, as we're now saying, because increasingly we have recognized that there's more than two ways to recognize gender, you know, the whole LBGTQ, the identity and politics that we've been talking about. So there are multiple ways to have identity. And the one that interested me more growing up was the cultural identity. I wanted to know why 500 years after the Spanish arrived, I can still call myself a Mopan, that I can still speak my language, that I still have a relationship with the physical environment. I wanted to know why, how is it? So obviously one of the answers that I can see was that people made sacrifices. People died so that others can live. So we have an obligation, a duty, as the current inheritors of this world to pass on another world to our children, whatever color they might be, whichever country they might be. Because going back to us being migrants, I cannot say for sure that the Mopan of Belize will continue living in San Antonio, San Jose, and San Pedro, Colombia. They might well go up to New York. They might go to Australia. That is the history of the migration. We're not walking along the Bering Strait now. We're getting onto a jet and crossing. So obviously, this, this, this story of migration continues. But I would like that in order to be confident, we need to be able to contribute meaningfully to the discussion that is taking place globally. I have heard People say, but we didn't cause this problem. Belize didn't cause this climate change. But if Belizeans don't understand what caused it to begin with, then how are we going to contribute to the solution? If Maya people don't understand in their communities, whether it be the um, the Maya community just down the road from this office, or all the way in Toledo, or in the Petén, if we don't acknowledge our role and what our culture can contribute to those solutions, then we are part of the problem. But how do we get past that? So I think it goes back to history. And so if I can have any legacy, it would be to reach out, to communicate that we need to know where we came from, how we got to be here. And even though we may not know where we will end up, as I was saying at the very beginning, I didn't know I was going to be in this seat. No idea. I was surprised as my neighbor. But Given that I have that opportunity, I must continue to talk as knowledgeably. I must do my research. I must be respectful. I must listen. and know that this world is diverse for a reason. Human ingenuity has been manifesting itself for thousands of years. We have the Egyptians. We have um, the Mesoamerican empires. And now we have the current um, empires that, that are the, the world order that we now have. So the life continues. And what I was saying the other day, I don't know if the earth will survive. No, that's not what I meant. I don't know if human beings will survive climate change. The earth will. We have gone, the earth has gone through multiple ice ages. But will humans survive? And of the humans that survive, who will they be? What kind of future will they have if they manage to survive? So I think the time for being very insular and just thinking of my issues within the country of Belize, I think that ship has sailed a long time ago. We are very much global. We are interconnected. What happens in with those glaciers melting means that my sea level in Belize is going to rise and we're going to lose land. So I think if there's any legacy I can leave, it would be to, to listen to others, to communicate, to learn, never stop learning. I will stop learning when my mind goes, 
which I hope it doesn't happen, not good here, or when I pass away. But until then, I want to continue teaching and learning. I think if we, if that is something that we can do, I believe the world can be a more equitable place. It can be a more um, just place. And I think those are two very important values to promote. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Governor General. I see that we have uh, we have some special guests that have joined us. Um, I'm seeing uh, the Honorable Dolores Balramos on screen and the Honorable uh, Lennox. Uh, I can't make what the rest of the evening. But um, if you allow me, Madam Governor General, I would now invite you to, to speak some to the substance of, of the theme that, that was chosen for, for, the main, for the main presentation today. And then I hope we have an opportunity to listen from our distinguished guests who are uh, the Honorable Lennox Schumann, who has also joined us. So uh, if we proceed with your core presentation, and then I hope that we have some time to listen from our grace, those uh, who have graced us with your, with your presence as well. Please. Thank you, Ambassador. So it's that context to Lakalesh. Greetings to you all. Today, I want to talk about cultural education. We all recognize the education policies and systems have often been used as a means to, the systemic, to systemically discriminate against indigenous people, assimilate them into the broader society, and thus destroy their culture, languages, identity, and rights, and displace them of their lands, territories, and natural resources. And we continue to see the, re the repercussions of such policies, such as in Canada over the summer. For the last three decades, many states have addressed or attempted to address problems of intercultural bilingual education. However, sadly, these education systems, policies, and curricula are rarely developed with Indigenous people's participation or consent, and as a result, have mostly failed Indigenous children and continue to, to deny them vital life opportunities and cultural security. Indeed, in the case of Belize, there is government support for bilingual intercultural education, and there are currently two schools for the Maya and the Garifuna people. But there are challenges because despite teachers being paid, they have been unable to work in partnership with parents to address the policies and curricula that need to be developed for cultural education. Given the importance of lands and natural resources to the livelihoods, culture, and well being of Indigenous people, their traditional knowledge about their lands is also interconnected to education, where elders pass down knowledge, values, and their histories to new generations. In this way then, indigenous people's education needs to be connected to all facets of their lives. Lamentably, quite often the teachers are not qualified to teach indigenous people and continue to use mainstream methodology. In my experience, the teachers have been the ones to push back on, on indigenous led education. The state has a duty to provide relevant training to these individuals and to ensure that the schools are monitored to deliver on their missions. At the same time, many parents did not really express an interest in their children learning in such institutions, particularly if done in the native languages. For many parents, going to formal school meant that their children would no longer have to toil in the sun or work with their hands. So we have to educate parents and the wider community to the benefits of indigenous education if we genuinely want students to use their indigenous identity to underpin their academic, social and cultural successes within the school environment and to be successful in life as a Maya, as a Garifuna or whatever your indigenous culture is. Sadly, it seems to be that the ultimate aim is to continue as normal, to not really fully implement bilingual intercultural education. As the, as the Secretary General mentioned earlier in his video, all of us can participate in cultural education outside of the walls of, outside the formal walls of education systems. As a student of culture, I have been interested to see how values manifest themselves in religion, spirituality, in the environment, and through our livelihood, and how we engage with one another. I can see that there is a greater need for understanding the different worldviews that are present when we interact with each other as we build relationships. We must be aware of our conscious and unconscious bias in understanding and dealing with the world. 
This is particularly true if we are policymakers and lawmakers. And we need to check our privileges more so than ever. The sustainable development goals are said to be based on three pillars, environmental protection, social sustainability, economic sustainability. I would argue that culture should be included as a fourth pillar. For the SDG goals to be attained, uncomfortable but ethical questions need to be addressed to build back the trust between indigenous people and others to increase the resilience and adaptation of humans. Indigenous knowledge is an extension of indigenous culture and the world can truly benefit if we foster trust. If interested parties, which include states, corporations and multilaterals are respectful of indigenous people's knowledge, which are not narratives nulli as no one's knowledge to be appropriated any more than our land was terra nullius in the 1500. The power imbalance meant that indigenous voices were absent from the national conversation of development for so long. The current context by all accounts of using intellectual property framework is falling short of leaving no one behind if indigenous people are being excluded. The rights of private property ownership in modern liberal democracies continues to be at odds with how indigenous people own knowledge. But this gap can be filled through cultural education that can help us to understand how to be respectful and mindful of indigenous knowledge, particularly as our indigenous systems include cultural, historical, ethical, political, religious, spiritual, and moral dimensions that do not allow for easy translation into Western paradigms. Finally, how can cultural education help us address climate change? As Dolores Huerta said in her TED talk recently, live simply so that others can simply live. Never more, is, never more is this more pronounced than in the last 18 months where we have witnessed massive forest fires, glaciers melting and heat waves affecting all of us. We need to do more global thinking and to unite beyond borders. We need to change how we think about the world in my opinion, we need to act local, but think global. I would like to leave a legacy of justice for our children. And I think the only way we can truly achieve that is through cultural education so that they can imitate it and be proud of it for the rest of their lives and pass it on to their children. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Governor General. A truly inspiring message, and you touch on several of the issues that are core to the work we do at the OAS. The importance we place on the urgency of dealing with the issues of climate change, um, especially for some of our, of our low lying coastal states in the Caribbean region, which we have seen getting the brunt of prolonged hurricanes uh, lately. Um, so several of the issues, as I said, you know, we deal with it and, and I do share your view that we have to act together to solve all of those problems. And for the OS, we mean as a region, for the region of the Americas. So um, now I would like to uh, briefly offer the floor to the Honorable Dolores Valderamos, and then we will invite uh, the Honorable Lennox Schumann of Guyana, who graciously joined us again also today. So, Minister Dolores Valderamos is the Minister of Rural Transformation, Community Development, Labor, and Local Government. And she's also has the portfolio of indigenous issues. Minister, it's great to see you again. Thank you so much for gracing us with your presence this morning. Thank you very, very much, hosts, hostesses, Representative Coimbra. It's a great pleasure to see you again, sir. Um, Ambassador Mendez, our very own Belizean assistant, uh, OAS SecGen. Um, Madam uh, Governor General, uh, uh, Her Excellency Fruela Salam, and all others, it's a pleasure to join you. A small correction as we go forward. I think that um, someone in the government uh, department uh, made a small error. Um, I am actually the Minister for Human Development, Families, and Indigenous Peoples Affairs. Um, proud to be so as the first one appointed by a government of Belize. Um, and so very, very happy to join you this morning. And 
<clears throat> beginning, first of all, with a great commendation to um, Her Excellency Proila for your very thought-provoking and inspiring uh, presentation about the role of Indigenous peoples and our quest uh, to, to make sure that there is inclusion in all the work that we do. I have said, and many of you may know this, but, but I like to repeat it, that the mantra of our ministry now, our new ministry, I call it, of human development families and indigenous people's affairs is equality and inclusion. And if, is, and if that is to be the case, then the inclusion and the quest for equal opportunities and equality of all our indigenous peoples has to be a part of our ministry work. Last week at the uh, rainbow flag raising at the British High Commission for the celebration of Pride Week for our LGBT plus uh, brothers and sisters, we made the same pledge for equality and inclusion. But since today is um, a focus on the indigenous peoples of our of our world, of, but especially of the Americas. Um, I want to um, recognize all indigenous peoples. I see that there is participation from Uruguay, if I'm not mistaken. Very, very happy to see that. And um, I want to say that we believe that despite COVID, um, uh, we have hit the ground running in terms of addressing the needs the aspirations, the difficulties that we have found with our indigenous communities in Belize. And although there may be persons who believe that um, sometimes the, the inclusion or the, the, um, the putting there of a ministry of indigenous people's affairs may sometimes cause, um, um, how shall I say, it, it may sometimes cause um, not conflict, but a little bit of complication is how certain people see it. I would like to say to the participants today that certainly in our own context, we will do our level best, not to cause complication and difficulty, but to work towards the, the equality and inclusion that we have pledged. And another part of our mantra in relation to indigenous persons, um, and the affairs of all our indigenous people, I think has to be first of all respect, and then engagement, as we have said, and communication. Um, uh, members here today would be aware that in 2015, there was a consent judgment of the Caribbean Court of Justice in relation to the recognition by the government of Belize of Maya customary land rights um, in all 39 communities, Maya communities of the Toledo district. Um, some implementation has happened, um, perhaps not enough. And now we are seeing the challenges um, and the opportunities that come with those challenges of working towards the implementation of that consent order, um, Ambassador Mendez and, and Representative Coimbra and others. But focusing now back on the, the topic of today, let allow me please to, to congratulate and to commend um, Her Excellency Freula uh, once again. And the what stays with me in terms of your presentation, um, Governor General, is the reality of climate change and how it affects all of us. I happen to live near the sea in Ladyville, which is not far from Belize City and very close to the airport, five minutes from the airport, the international airport. And we have had, my husband and I and our family, we have had to uh, perhaps every year bring in loads of sand and material to fill the, 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 the coastline. We don't have a beach. We do have a beautiful view, but it's mangroves in front of our property. Um, and but we have had to actually put a landfill to keep to make sure that when the hurricanes blow in and the high tides come, we at least have a little bit of protection and we won't be walking in our with, with our ankles uh, in water, etc. So I, I, I do want to say that 
climate change is absolutely real. And I commend um, Her Excellency for bringing up the need for us to include culture in the other um, aspects of the sustainable development goals um, that, that we have seen, environmental, social, economic, and we of course add cultural. All of us have rich cultural backgrounds. I consider myself to be Creole of ethnicity, but of course very, very mixed. And I remember the late, great uh, lady from Toledo, Leela Vernon, she used to say, the who's a Creole nugget? The who's a Creole no got no culture. So those of us in the country all bring rich cultural backgrounds uh, to the reality um, that is Belize today. But focusing now today on our indigenous people, I really want to take this opportunity because we have just come from the, the week of in, um, celebrating indigenous people. I would like to salute our Garifuna sisters and brothers and of course, all our Maya sisters and brothers, whether Kekchi, Mopan, or Yucatec Maya um, from throughout Belize, from the length of, and breadth of, of our beautiful Belize. So um, with that said, I am happy, very happy to participate. Um, I wish the, the consultation a lot of um, success, Ambassador uh, Mendez. And um, only to add that the importance of culture as we look for the equality, inclusion, and advancement of indigenous people and all people in Belize um, is going to be something that we will continue to focus on and make sure that we pledge ourselves to the work going forward. There may be complications, as I have said, but challenges always bring opportunities uh, for betterment and for the work that we must continue if we are to build Belize, our region of Central America, the broader Caribbean, and of course, all of the Americas. So it is a great pleasure to participate. Thank you for allowing me these uh, remarks. Completely unprepared. I didn't. I actually didn't know that I would be asked to um, to speak, Ambassador Mendes. But thank you for the opportunity. Um, kudos um, once again, and you will see participants that um, the earrings that I have in today are from the the Maya um, communities. And I am pleased to say, I may be revealing something um, that Her Excellency doesn't want me to reveal, but they are a gift to me from her. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you, Sister. Thank you for gracing us with your presence. Apologies for that slide miss up with the designation of your, of your portfolio. Uh, so I am very happy now with another surprise guest that is that joined us today, uh, the Honorable Lennox Schumann from Guyana. Uh, sir, you have the floor. Excellency, Governor, Ex Excellency Ambassador, Honorable Ministers and friends and colleagues. Um, this is very impromptu. Once again, much like the Honorable Minister, I was simply here to listen and observe as I was invited. But given the opportunity, I will take it to commend Her Excellency's remarks in at, at least pointing out some of the fundamental issues that Indigenous peoples face and potentially how we could move forward in addressing some of those. Um, I think there is a tremendous challenge ahead of us as Indigenous peoples in terms of self-determination in recognizing the lack of implementation of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, as well as the OAS Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. There are yet many states that have not adopted components of those declarations in how they govern their Indigenous Peoples. There are many states that do not permit Indigenous Peoples to a great extent the right to self-determination, the right to utilize their lands, the right to own their lands, uh, much less control their lands. And I think those are some fundamental questions that need to be addressed as we move forward in addressing climate change. 
um, Her Excellency rightfully and so tactfully placed climate change on the agenda, which there isn't a population that is affected most by climate change as Indigenous peoples. And to contextualize it, Indigenous peoples have never enjoyed the financial resources for mobility, geographical mobility. And in many cases, many situations, they're caught in conflict with state and private actors in how they address their land rights. So by virtue of that, as you start to see floodwaters go up, the effects of climate change, it basically locks them into a situation where they do not have the financial ability to simply go out and say, I'm going to buy a plot of land and leave this place that I cannot survive anymore. That is one. The second thing is our traditional lifestyle in itself um, stands um, to be destroyed with climate change. We no longer enjoy the same hunting ground, the same fishing ground, the same farming ground. We no longer in, enjoy the territorial integrity because as our lands start to become more and more affected, then there's also for the places that are high or the places that are cultivatable that you will find a tremendous amount of invasion in those territories. And I think a big part of it deals with the political will of nations. I don't know if the, the threat of resources versus land rights um, becomes a reality in many states, but I know the governance question must be answered. Um, take for example, and I use myself as an example, it took us 54 years in Guyana to have the first um, indigenous deputy speaker. Why did it take this long? And we have never seen an indig indigenous prime minister, a president, a head of state. Um, all we've seen are what I'd say politically aligned actors in the Guyanese politics that are not permitted to speak on the very issues. And I, I want to suspect that, that, is, that this is not only confined to Guyana, that this is across the Caribbean where there's a silencing to a great extent of dissenting voices and by pulling indigenous peoples and indigenous leaders into these political circles, that it somehow muzzles their voice on the issues and the topics that really matter to the people. I look forward to the OAS potentially putting forth a framework. If, if there's one, forgive me, I have not read it, but putting forth a framework in how member states move to addressing climate change in indigenous communities or with the inclusion of indigenous peoples to ensure that we're not left out of that. Her Excellency rightfully um, placed that again in terms of our cultural preservation, the cultural identity. If you were to put those two together, climate change and the SDGs, you'll find that there's a cultural deterioration. It is a cultural genocide that indigenous peoples will face with this new global challenge. And I'm hopeful that member states and themselves will look forward. Don't just look at what's happening today, but take very coherent actions in how we address these things in the long term, how we start to build the frameworks now to be able to ensure that these very important parts that are so in, important to the most marginalized populations in the world are not left off the books. I have often said, you know, if I were to roll back to the governance component, it is only in the post-colonial states where you'll find indigenous peoples do not enjoy self-governance. If you look at what happens in Asia and Europe and the Middle East, they're called royalties. You've got the, the, the Saudi royal family, the Qataris, the, you know, you, you talk of it. India, um, China, I mean, there's, there, there's still other issues with indigenous peoples in those countries, no doubt. But it is only in post-colonial states where indigenous peoples do not enjoy governance of their country. And I think I, I really would not want to diagnose why that is so but I would suspect that a big part of it has to do with the utilization of the state's resources and the tremendous amount of subsurface wealth that exists in these lands that it maybe poses a threat to a lot of um, political factions. And I want to implore the OAS that in whatever framework is developed, whatever framework is put forth, 
that there must be inclusion of indigenous peoples at a governance level and at a policy making level to ensure that that our issues are not wiped off the books, you know, for some other interest. Excellency, I want to thank you for your presentation. I look forward to maybe um, visiting you in Belize, Honorable Minister and Excellency Ambassador, friends and colleagues. I hopefully within this, uh, this year, if we have COVID restrictions um, pulled off a bit, that I'd be able to travel and, you know, at least get a clear understanding of some of the regional issues. I want to say thank you for the opportunity um, for speaking is very impromptu. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you for gracing us with your presence this morning. Uh, both you and Minister Valderamas were indeed very pleasant, very gracious surprise uh, for us, but we're very happy to have you on such important issues. Um, Madam Governor General, I think that we're right about having an ending or hour that we had. Uh, anticipated this event with this chat with the OS. We've been doing several of them uh, across the Caribbean, focusing on different issues that the OS deals with. And we're very happy that you were able to, to inspire us with your words, um, um, you and, and the, the two ministers, which have given us so much to ponder as all of us strive for a fairer and more just hemisphere in which all four persons can live in harmony. Uh, Honorable Lennox, um, if you provide us with your contacts, I will ensure that my office sends you all the documentation on the many areas uh, at the OAS where we're dealing with issues that have with indigenous people's issues. And of course, many opportunities for you as a, as a politician, as a leader, as somebody with, with a very, uh, very, very intimate knowledge of these issues to become active. You know, we need all hands on deck to make sure that these issues get the, give the attendance, get the, atten get the attention that they so badly deserve. Um, thank you once again uh, to, all of, to all of you. And I'm happy now to, to offer the floor to um, Mr. Luis Coimbra, who will be offering closing remarks for our session today. Don Luis, please. Thank you, Ambassador Mendes. We have come finally to the end of over one solid hour of a steering conversation that was informative, inspirational, and educational. The end of this edition of a chat with the OAS is another hopeful rung on the ladder towards the dawn of a new era. After the ascension of Her Excellency, Madame Freula, as the new Governor General of Belize, the indigenous leader and advocate, Mary Simon, was appointed as Canada's governor general. In Chile, Elisa Loncon, an indigenous Mapuche, academic and activist, was elected president of the Constitutional Congress. With each step we take in this direction, we blaze a trail towards progress that is constant and sustainable so that the standards proposed by the American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples are now more achievable. As we continue to embrace the richness of our diversity in the hemisphere, we acknowledge with pride not only the presence in the Americas of Indigenous Peoples, the descendants of the original populations of our lands, but also their immense contribution to development, plurality, and cultural diversity that have been fundamentally important to humanity. Our learning process is part and parcel of shaping this broad appreciation. In that regard, I moved to reiterate the profound thanks of the OAS to Her Excellency Froila Zalan for her gracious acceptance of the invitation to today's chat with the OAS and for the stimulating presentation which she delivered today. This presentation is going to be available to schools for download uh, through the OAS Facebook website, OAS National Office in Belize Facebook website. It is just left for me now to say thank
thank you to the members of the virtual audience and to acknowledge the hard work of my OS colleagues, technicians, and everyone whose contribution made today possible and successful. Please be sure to tune into the next edition of a chat with the OAS on a date to be announced and do continue to be safe. Thank you very much. Have a good day.